Welcome to the chilling exploration of the making of a serial killer. Today, we delve deep into the psyche and life events that shape a person into a cold-blooded murderer. Prepare yourself for a journey into the darkest corners of the human mind. This is Born of Darkness, unveiling the birth of a serial killer. Every story has a beginning, and for many serial killers, it starts with a troubled childhood. Studies have shown that a significant number of serial killers experienced severe abuse and neglect in their formative years. Meet John Doe, whose early life was marred by unimaginable horrors. Children who grow up in abusive environments often develop deep psychological scars. John Doe, for example, was subjected to physical and emotional abuse by his parents. This kind of trauma can lead to dissociation, a coping mechanism where the individual disconnects from reality. As John grew older, his experiences of abuse didn't just leave him scarred, they began to manifest in disturbing ways. He started torturing animals, a common early warning sign of future violent behavior. These acts of cruelty were not just random acts of violence, but a way for him to exert control and power, something he desperately lacked in his chaotic home life. John's school life was no escape from the horrors he faced at home. Bullying and social isolation became a norm, further feeding his rage and sense of alienation. Teachers and peers often noticed his strange behavior, but dismissed it as odd rather than a cry for help. The neglect from the school system added another layer to his growing resentment towards society. The teenage years for John were a tumultuous time. His interactions with peers became increasingly hostile and he started exhibiting aggressive tendencies. His dark fantasies began to take shape during this period, fantasies that would later become a grim reality. He developed an obsession with death, often drawing disturbing images and writing about violent acts in his diary. By the time John reached adulthood, the seeds of his dark side had fully sprouted. He struggled to hold down jobs, and his relationships were fraught with dysfunction. The mask of normalcy he tried to wear was thin and often slipped, revealing the monster beneath. He started to stalk and harass women, his fantasies inching closer to reality. John's first kill was not a spontaneous act, but the culmination of years of pent-up rage and meticulous planning. He chose his victim carefully, someone who embodied the elements of his childhood tormentors. The act of killing gave him a sense of power and control he had never experienced before. It was a euphoric moment, one that he would chase again and again. With each kill, John became more confident and daring. He began to leave clues and taunt the police, deriving pleasure from the cat and mouse game. His intelligence and meticulous nature made him a formidable opponent for law enforcement. The thrill of the hunt and the act of killing became his primary source of satisfaction. The public began to take notice as John's killings became more frequent and brutal. Media coverage sensationalized his crimes, often portraying him as a mastermind evading capture. This notoriety fed his ego, making him feel invincible. The fear he instilled in the community gave him a twisted sense of achievement. Despite his growing confidence, John was not infallible. The police were closing in, using advancements in forensic science to piece together the puzzle of his crimes. John's arrogance and desire for recognition led to mistakes that ultimately became his downfall. He was captured and the full extent of his atrocities came to light. In court, John showed no remorse for his actions. His demeanor was cold and detached, as if he were recounting someone else's deeds. The trial revealed the depth of his psychopathy and the chilling reality of what he had become. He was sentenced to life in prison, but the questions remained. Could his transformation into a monster have been prevented? What does his story say about our society? The story of John Doe is a harrowing reminder of the potential for darkness within the human soul. It forces us to confront uncomfortable truths about the impact of abuse, neglect, and societal failures. Understanding the factors that contribute to the making of a serial killer is crucial in preventing future tragedies.
As we close this chapter, we are left with a profound sense of the fragility of the human psyche and the importance of compassion, intervention, and understanding in the fight against such horrors. But let's delve deeper into the intricacies of John's journey from his disturbing childhood to his eventual capture. Understanding the full spectrum of his life offers a comprehensive view of how such a monster is created. John Doe was born in a small, seemingly peaceful town. However, behind closed doors, his life was anything but peaceful. His father was an alcoholic prone to violent outbursts, while his mother was emotionally detached, overwhelmed by her own mental health issues. From a young age, John was exposed to physical abuse from his father and neglect from his mother. The first signs of John's emerging dark side appeared when he was just seven years old. Neighbors often heard the sounds of his father's rage and John's cries for help. School should have been a sanctuary for John, but it turned out to be another battleground. His classmates bullied him mercilessly, calling him names and physically tormenting him. These experiences isolated John further, driving him deeper into his own mind where his dark fantasies began to take root. As John entered his teenage years, his behavior became increasingly erratic. He started torturing small animals, a chilling precursor to the violence he would later inflict on humans. This phase is critical in understanding the development of a serial killer. Torturing animals allowed John to feel a sense of power and control, emotions that were otherwise absent in his life. John's fascination with death and violence grew stronger. He would spend hours drawing gruesome scenes and writing about his fantasies of power and domination. These fantasies provided an escape from his painful reality and became a coping mechanism for his unresolved trauma. By the time John was in his late teens, his antisocial behavior had escalated. He became more isolated, withdrawing from any social interactions. His few attempts at relationships ended in disaster as he struggled with intimacy and trust. The only place he felt any semblance of control was in his fantasies. John's first brush with the law came when he was caught stalking a woman from his neighborhood. He had followed her for weeks, meticulously documenting her every move. When confronted by the police, John was eerily calm, showing no remorse for his actions. This encounter with law enforcement only reinforced his belief that he was above the rules of society. John's first kill was the culmination of years of planning and fantasizing. He chose his victim carefully, ensuring she fit the profile of those he despised the most women who reminded him of his neglectful mother and those who had bullied him. The act itself was brutal and methodical. For John, it was not just about the kill, it was about the power and control he exerted over his victim. The aftermath of the first kill was a pivotal moment for John. He felt a rush of euphoria, a sense of invincibility. This feeling was addictive, and he knew he would kill again. Each subsequent murder was more daring and brutal, as he refined his methods and savored the thrill of the hunt. Understanding the mind of a serial killer like John requires delving into the complex interplay of psychological factors. John exhibited traits commonly associated with psychopathy, a lack of empathy, superficial charm, and a grandiose sense of self-worth. These traits, combined with his traumatic upbringing, created a perfect storm for the development of his murderous tendencies. Psychopaths like John are often highly intelligent and manipulative. They are able to blend into society, masking their true nature behind a facade of normalcy. This makes them particularly dangerous as they can evade detection for years, sometimes even decades. For John, the act of killing was not just about the murder itself, but the entire process leading up to it. He meticulously planned each kill, studying his victims and their routines. This planning stage gave him a sense of control and anticipation that was almost as satisfying as the kill itself. 
John derived immense pleasure from the fear and pain of his victims. He would often prolong the suffering, savoring each moment. This sadistic pleasure is a hallmark of many serial killers who view their victims as mere objects to be used for their gratification. As John's killing spree continued, he became more confident and daring. He started leaving clues for the police, enjoying the media attention and the fear he instilled in the community. This cat-and-mouse game with law enforcement was thrilling for John as it fed his need for recognition and power. The media often portrayed John as a mastermind, a genius evading capture. This notoriety further inflated his ego, making him feel invincible. However, this same arrogance would eventually lead to his downfall. Despite his meticulous planning, John was not infallible. His desire for recognition led to mistakes that allowed the police to close in on him. Advances in forensic science, particularly DNA profiling, played a crucial role in his capture. John had left behind traces of evidence that, when pieced together, painted a clear picture of his guilt. John's capture was a relief for the community but left many questions unanswered. How could someone so monstrous have lived among them unnoticed? What signs were missed, and could his reign of terror have been prevented? John's trial was a media spectacle, with every detail of his gruesome crimes laid bare. He showed no remorse, his demeanor cold and detached. The trial revealed the depth of his psychopathy and the chilling reality of what he had become. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The trial also sparked a broader conversation about the factors that contribute to the making of a serial killer. Experts debated whether John was born evil or if his environment had shaped him into a monster. The consensus was that it was a combination of both a perfect storm of genetic predisposition and environmental triggers. The story of John Doe is a harrowing reminder of the potential for darkness within the human soul. It forces us to confront uncomfortable truths about the impact of abuse, neglect, and societal failures. Understanding the factors that contribute to the making of a serial killer is crucial in preventing future tragedies. Early intervention is key. Children who show signs of severe trauma and antisocial behavior need immediate psychological support. Schools and communities must be vigilant and proactive in identifying and addressing these issues. Mental health resources should be readily available, and the stigma surrounding mental illness needs to be dismantled. Furthermore, we must strive to create a society where compassion and understanding prevail. By fostering environments where individuals feel valued and supported, we can mitigate the factors that contribute to the development of violent tendencies. As we close this chapter, we are left with a profound sense of the fragility of the human psyche and the importance of compassion, intervention, and understanding in the fight against such horrors. The story of John Doe serves as a grim reminder that monsters are not born in isolation. They are often the product of our collective failings. Understanding the making of a serial killer is not just about studying the individual, but examining the societal conditions that allow such darkness to flourish. It is a call to action, a plea for vigilance and compassion in the face of unimaginable evil. Only by addressing the root causes can we hope to prevent the emergence of future monsters and ensure a safer, more empathetic world for all.